Hey everyone, welcome to today's video. We'll be taking a look at a really fascinating game that Gary Kasparov played back in 1994 in a simultaneous exhibition in Tel Aviv. His opponent was Dmitry Tiomkin, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, and he was a fairly strong player actually. In the database we have him at about 2300 ELO, so for a simultaneous exhibition, very strong player. I came across this game as it featured one of my all-time favorite lines in chess, the infamous note boom variation of the semislav. I have played this countless number of times from both the white side and the black side, so I was really excited to see how Gary Kasparov, of all people, navigated this variation in a simultaneous exhibition where he'd be really looking to dominate. Okay, Let's get into the game and see how things play out. Gary Kasparov is playing the white pieces. So the game starts with d4, d5, c4, e6, queen's gambit declined, knight c3, and c6. So we have our infamous pawn triangle here. And Gary plays knight f3, allowing the note boom. Black takes, and we see a4, bishop b4, e3, and black plays b5. In the spirit of the note boom, we are hanging on to our extra pawns and looking to get those queenside pawns rolling. Bishop to d2, breaking that pin. Black plays a5, getting his queenside pawns going. White captures on b5, and at this stage here, black takes the knight. We recapture with the bishop, and black retakes. Now look at these pawns here, don't they look formidable? We simply cannot allow them to start rolling forward, so white must break this structure immediately, and Gary plays b3, challenging that black structure. Black would really love to play b4 and start rolling forward with his pawns. Unfortunately, playing b4 here immediately simply loses that pawn because we have an unprotected rook on a8. So white would simply take that pawn, and black cannot recapture that because his rook is loose. So instead of pushing forward with b4 immediately, black plays bishop to b7. He guards his rook, and now there is a massive threat in the position to start rolling forward with the pawns. So white takes on c4. Black pushes forward, hitting the bishop, and the bishop drops back to b2. And this position here really captures what the note boom variation is all about. Black has got some very scary looking queenside pawns here. There are no white pawns in front of them, so you can easily imagine them rolling forward and creating some really dangerous situations for white. But white is not without his own trumps. He has a very strong central configuration here. He will get very easy development. He will most likely be able to play e4 at some stage as well and get an absolutely enormous central configuration. So the battle really is, can white crash through in the center of the board or will black simply steamroll white on the queen side and queen one of his pawns? So we see knight f6, bishop to d3, knight d7, castles, queen c7, so we are still following mainline theory of the note boom at this stage. Black castles and f4, so Gary is looking to set up a really strong grip in the center with an eventual e4 coming as well. Absolute domination in the center of the board, but let's see how things play out. And black pushes his pawn forward to a4, getting things rolling on the queen side. Now you might look at that and Scratch your head a bit. Wait a second, isn't white protecting that square twice and black only has that square guarded once? How is this possible? Can't white just win this pawn now? No, he cannot, because if white tries to take this pawn on a4, have a look at this. He loses the game immediately with queen to c6. A double attack. We are threatening checkmate on g2 with the battery, the queen and the bishop, and we are also hitting that rook on a4 as well. 
So white would be completely busted here. He cannot defend g2 and the rook at the same time. So, so some really good tactical awareness from black to push his pawn forward, even though it looks like it seems it's not possible. We see e4 from Gary, which actually turns out to be a huge inaccuracy as well. We'll come back to this and, and unpack it in detail shortly, but let's just see how things play out a bit here. Black pushes forward with a3, hitting the bishop, which must drop back to c1. Rook to d8, so we are lining up now. Have a look at all these white pieces lined up on that file. And Gary plays e5, which turns out to actually be a huge inaccuracy. There is an absolutely crushing and insane sequence of events that could have played out here in this game. But unfortunately, Black did not see the crushing continuation against Gary Kasparov. His knight is under attack and he drops it back to e8. Let's just quickly take a look at this crushing sequence that, that could have been. It is absolutely insane. I was having, I spent so much time looking at this sequence before creating this video because it is just really crazy to, to understand this. Have a look at this. Knight to c5, right? We are taking advantage of this x-ray from the rook. If we take this knight, on f6. Have a look at this. This just gets absolutely crazy. The knight takes on d3. We bring our queen out to g4, threatening checkmate. That must be guarded. Black plays g6. We shuffle our queen across to h4, looking to come in this way. So black brings his queen to d6, multi-purpose move. His idea is that he can meet queen to h6 with queen to f8 and completely neutralize that threat. But the queen on d6 is also hitting this pawn, which would come with check and pick up the rook. So white needs to do something about that. He defends that threat with knight to b3. And have a look at this knight, right? There's a black knight on d3 and it can't go anywhere behind enemy lines. Look at this. It can't go here, that's covered by a pawn. Can't go here, it's covered by a pawn. Can't go to f4, that's covered. Can't go here, that's covered. If it goes to b2, it'll just get exchanged. It'll weaken Black's pride and joy of the note boom, which is his queenside pawns, and those pawns will start falling. So this knight is just behind enemy lines, just hanging there. But have a look at this. Black simply shuffles across with his rook to c8, starting to target some of these weaknesses. And if white tries to ever kick that knight out or to win that knight, we simply reinforce it with the bishop. We bring our bishop out to e4. And it proves that this knight can actually just sit there basically forever. There, there is no way for white to really challenge that knight. It's basically an outposted octopus knight behind enemy lines, but there's no pawn supporting it. When was the last time you saw an octopus knight either on d6 or d3, just floating there without pawn support. So it turns out this that this knight is absolutely impossible to, to remove from here. I spent so much time trying to refute this before making this video, and it was just in, incredibly insane that this knight can basically just stay there and cripple the entire white position forever, basically. It, it, cannot be booted out. Let's say, for example, we try to add more pressure to that knight, right? We try to bring our queen back. Have a look at this. Black just simply scoops up that pawn. And if you think that we're just picking up two pieces for the rook now, well, you're wrong because when we recapture here, the rook comes in and oops, you've lost your knight. So believe me, I, I spent so much time trying to get this knight out of my territory and it just can't be done. And have a look at the engine analysis. 4.6 in Black's favor. That knight just can't be booted out. This is absolutely insane. And to be honest, I don't blame uh, the Black player for, for not finding that continuation. Because if I were playing this game as Black in an over-the-board game and I got to this position, even if I saw the continuation of knight to c5 and I come into d3, I would think to myself, okay, I get the bishop, but then my knight is trapped. And 
white will probably round it up uh, over a sequence of moves. It would never even cross my mind that that knight would be able to sit on d3 basically forever and never get booted out. It is an absolutely insane continuation there of what could have potentially been in this game. But he does not play that continuation. Instead we see knight e8, knight b3 from Gary, g6, queen d2, striking the loose pawn on b4. And in the note boom, if the queen side pawns fall, it's basically the, the end of that because white just has an absolutely crushing amount of pressure and momentum in the center and on the king side that if the queen side falls, it's, it's basically lights out. Bishop to c6, so this was a really surprising move. Can't we just simply take that pawn? Gary asks the question, what's wrong with simply scooping up the pawn? If we win the queenside pawns, we're basically winning as white in the note boom. So what's going on here? So what was black's idea? He plays rook to b8, hitting the queen. Okay, Gary drops his queen back to c3. Surely still scratching his head. What is, what is this chap's idea here? Bishop to g2. Have a look at this. Sacrificing his bishop. And take a look at his idea here. Gary retakes the bishop. Now we have a queen check. Forking the king and the knight. And notice now with the rook that was on b8. We have two pieces piling up on the knight. Gary intercepts the check with his rook. And Black thinks that he can just now come in and, and take the, the extra piece and that he snagged the pawn on g2. He comes in, takes the knight, Gary exchanges queens. Now unfortunately for him, he oversaw the simple but very effective and crushing bishop to e4. Have a look at this. We are hitting the loose rook on a8. We have opened up an x-ray against the loose rook on b3. So we have two hanging rooks at the moment. Black might think to himself initially, hey, I'm not actually losing a rook here because I'll just take your rook. But here's the point. We recapture with our king. Your rook on a8 is still hanging. We also have pressure here. So say, for example, you move your rook to c8, looking to counterattack here. We simply push forward. This pawn is falling. And once a3 falls, it would be an absolutely trivial endgame for Gary to promote his past pawn. So there we have it. A very fascinating game in the beloved note boom variation, played by none other than Gary Kasparov. A fascinating game with tactics on the board and some absolutely insane mind-blowing variations of, of what could have been as well. So I hope everyone enjoyed today's video. Thank you.